in less than two months, on May the 12th, got the date right, Gigi and I will have been married for 14 wonderful, blessed years. 14 years in less than two months. When we got married, I was 20. She was 18. Just got out of high school. We didn't have a big, elaborate, fancy wedding. Instead, all we had was $40 to pay the justice of the peace. And we showed up to the courthouse all by ourselves wearing T-shirts and blue jeans and tennis shoes. We didn't have a big, fancy wedding at all. But I tell you what, we achieved the goal. We got married. We became a husband and a wife. That was 14 years ago. And to the teenagers in the room this morning, that may sound like a long time, but let me tell you something. That is absolutely nothing, absolutely nothing compared to many couples in this room this morning. Brother Felton Hill, who was here this morning, a few days ago I was able to go sit in his living room and talk with him and his good wife, Sister Norma Rain. You know what they told me? They told me they had been married for over 60 years. Over 60 years. That's, that's almost double my life. They've been married. And then that's nothing compared to Bradley and Laurel Duggar, who've been married for going on 55 years. That's nothing compared to Lester and Charlene Crane, who've been married for 54 years, or Jimmy and B, who've been married for 53, or Lee and Joyce, who've been married for 53, or Linda and Larry, who've been married for 50, almost 50 years. I mean, the list could go on and on. You know it, and I know it. You and I both know that in this room this morning, we have so many couples here who have been committed to marriage. They've been committed to one another for decades, for several decades. And isn't that a blessing, brothers and sisters? Isn't that a blessing? I believe that's a blessing. But i got to tell you, unfortunately, we're living in a society today where for a lot of people, they, they don't feel that way anymore. But by that I mean that as each and every day passes by, it seems that marriage is becoming more and more obsolete. It is, it is something that for a lot of people, they just don't view it as important anymore. It is something that for a lot of people, they don't view it as, as sacred. They don't view it as really honorable and valuable to a, to a culture and, and a society. For a lot of people, they don't feel marriage is important anymore. And we can see this in a variety of different ways in our society. For example, this can be seen in how today more than half of all marriages end in divorce. It can also be seen with the gay marriage movement. And how for a lot of people, they are trying to redefine marriage. And then it can also be seen in how over 70% of Americans, over 70% think that divorce is okay. And it can also be seen in how fewer couples today are being married than ever before. And it can even be seen in, in what many people in Hollywood are doing, what, what the celebrities are, are doing. To take, for example, the reality TV star Kim Kardashian. Y'all know who Kim Kardashian is? Well, if you know who Kim Kardashian is, and hopefully you're aware that before she got married to, to rapper Kanye West a few years ago, before then she was married to NBA player Chris Humphreys. And do you know how long she and Chris Humphreys were married for? Ladies and gentlemen, they were married for a whopping 72 hours. For three days they were married. Then they got their marriage and know. And if you think that's bad enough, take, for example, Britney Spears. You know Britney Spears, right? Well, or a few years ago, Britney Spears went to Las Vegas with her childhood friend, a man named Jason Alexander. And they got married in Las Vegas. And you know how long they were married for? They were married for a whopping, not 55 years, but 55 hours. After 55 hours, they got their marriage annulled. You see, that's the kind of stuff going on in our world today. That's exactly how a lot of people feel about marriage. That's exactly how a lot of people are treating marriage. But the question is, what about us? What about me? What about you? How do we view marriage this morning? Do we view marriage like our world views marriage? Is our world thinking about marriage starting to rub off on us? Is it starting to impact our, our hearts and infiltrate our lives? Are we still sold on what the Bible says about marriage? Are we still sold on what Jesus says about marriage? 
How do we feel about marriage this morning? I think that's an important question for us to think about. But based on where our culture it has, has, has gone on this issue over the last few years, I think it is important this morning in this study that we pause for a few minutes and remind ourselves, remind ourselves once again of what the Bible has to say about marriage, of what God has to say about this sacred relationship. And before you tune me out this morning, before you think to yourself, well, this lesson really doesn't have anything to do with me. I don't know why I showed up to hear this lesson. This has nothing to do with me. Before you have that kind of attitude this morning, can I please beg you not to do that? Can, can I please emphasize to you that this issue that we're going to talk about this morning, it is relevant to each and every person in this room. It doesn't matter if you're older or younger. It doesn't matter if you are single or married. It doesn't matter if you ever want to get married or not. If you are a Christian, if you are a follower of Jesus Christ, then my friend, you need to understand that God wants you to understand what the Bible says about marriage. God wants you to understand what the Scriptures have to say about this very important issue. And so this morning, we want to talk about marriage a little bit. We want to talk about what the Bible has to say about this. Specifically, what I want us to do is I want us to consider this issue by going back to the beginning. And considering what the Bible tells us about the world's first marriage. The world's first marriage. Now, if you being the good Bible students that you are, I know you are already you already know where I'm going. You know that when we talk about the world's first marriage... We're talking about the marriage between the first man and the first woman to ever walk on this planet. We're talking about the marriage between Adam and Eve. Brothers and sisters, when we study the marriage between Adam and Eve, we learn some important and fundamental things that God wants us to know about marriage. We learn some things about marriage that many in our culture have seen to have forgotten. And so let's revisit that. Let's look at what we learned from the first marriage. Number one, when we studied the first marriage, one of the things we learned about marriage is we learn a lesson about origin. We learn a lesson about origin. That is, we learn a lesson about the origin of marriage. And so when you go to the first verse of the Bible this morning, go to Genesis 1 and verse 1. Will you please go there in your Bible? Look at Genesis 1 and verse 1. I want you to notice how the Bible opens up. In Genesis 1 and verse 1, the Bible says, In the beginning... In the beginning, God. Notice how in the beginning there was God. God was there in the beginning, and He did something. He created the heavens and the earth. When you continue to read that chapter, you read about the things that God had, had made. And He called these things good. He called them very good. We can even read in this chapter about how God made, how He made mankind. He made us in His image. But now go to chapter 2. Look at Genesis chapter 2 and verse number 18. In Genesis chapter 2 and verse 18, after making the first man Adam, the Bible says that the Lord said, It is not good for man to be alone. I will make him a helper suitable for him. Out of the ground the Lord God formed every beast of the fields and every bird of the sky, and he brought them to the man to see what he would call them. And whatever the man called a living creature, that was its name. The man gave names to all the cattle, and to the birds of the sky, and to every beast of the field. But for Adam, there was not found a helper suitable for him. So the Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall upon the man, and he slept. Then he took one of his ribs and closed up the flesh at that place. The Lord fashioned into a woman the rib which he had taken from the man and brought her to the man. The man said, This is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman because she was taken out of man for this reason. A man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife, and they shall become one flesh. Brothers and sisters, listen carefully this morning. What we just read in these verses, that is marriage. That, my friends, is biblical marriage. This is biblical marriage. And notice who made marriage. Notice man didn't make marriage, did he? Adam didn't make marriage. Eve didn't make marriage. The government, the Supreme Court, culture did not make marriage. No, marriage is God's creation. Marriage is God's creation. No matter what you may hear in the media today, 
young people, no matter what you may hear from your teachers at school or from your college professors or from your friends, you need to understand that we as human beings, we did not make marriage. We did not invent this relationship. Instead, God made marriage. Marriage is God's sacred institution. I want you to notice again how after speaking light into existence and separating light from darkness, after making the sun, the moon, and the stars, and the plants, and all the animals, and even after making us the first, the making human beings the first man and the first woman, notice after God made all those things, He then made marriage. He made marriage after He made man. And you know what that means? That means that marriage is literally almost as old as dirt. It is literally almost as old as dirt. God made marriage in the beginning. And like everything else God made, when God made marriage, it was good. It was very good. We learn that when we go back to the beginning. And I got to tell you, that's something we got to be reminded of. Oh, we got to be reminded of that in our culture today. This is something that we really got to buy into. We really got to be sold on this because if we're really sold on this, if we really accept the fact that God is the one who made marriage, then we also have to accept the fact that He has the authority. He has the right to set the rules for it. You see, since God made marriage, that means He has the inherent right to set the rules for it. We cannot make the rules for marriage. You know why? Because we didn't make marriage. We didn't invent this relationship. God is the one who introduced marriage into the world. Marriage is God's creation, and therefore, since He made it, He has the right to set the rules for it. And He certainly has set the rules for it, hasn't He? In fact, that brings us to the second thing we learn when we study the world's first marriage. Yes, we learn a lesson about origin, but a second lesson we learn is we also learn a lesson about order. We learn a lesson about order. That is, we learn about the rules or the laws that God has made for this relationship. I want you to go back. I want you to go in your Bibles now, I'm sorry, to, to Matthew chapter 19. Keep your finger at Genesis 2. We'll come back there, but go to Matthew chapter 19. You, you see, we got to understand that since creating, since first creating marriage, God has had rules for marriage. God has had laws for this relationship that He has firmly put in place. This was something that Jesus wanted the Pharisees to understand. And so we go to Matthew chapter 19 and verse number 3. To understand the context of Matthew 19, Jesus is, is very soon about to go and be crucified for the sins of the world. The time of his death is at hand. And, and things are very hostile for him in the city of Jerusalem. And we see that. We see a glimpse of that here in this context. In Matthew 19 and verse 3, it says some Pharisees came to Jesus testing him. Notice that. They came to Jesus testing him and asking, Is it lawful for a man to divorce his wife for any reason at all? And he answered and said, Have you not read that he who created them from the beginning made them male and female and said, For this reason a man shall leave his father and his mother and be joined to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. So they're no longer two, but one flesh. Well, therefore, God is joined together. Let no man separate. Now, I understand. Let's just stop right there. I understand. There's a lot we can say about these verses. We can have a whole sermon series just on these verses. But for now, I just want you to notice a few, a few important things. First, I want you to notice here how Jesus is a champion of God's original intent for marriage. Do you see that? He is a champion of God's original intent for marriage. Here the Pharisees come to Jesus, and they come to him with a very controversial question. They come to him asking, is it lawful for a man to divorce his wife for any reason? They felt that however Jesus answered that question, he was going to make somebody mad. He was going to isolate himself from somebody. This is a very controversial question during this time, and it's still one even in our time today, right? It's a very controversial question. But, but notice how Jesus responds. Jesus responds by saying, Have you not read that he who created them in the beginning made them male and female? Ladies and gentlemen, when he says, Have you not read, he's taking them back to the beginning. He's taking them back to the world's first marriage. He's taking them back and he's showing them God's 
original intent for marriage. He says that from the beginning, you Pharisees, God has had specific rules and expectations for this relationship. And you know what these include? Well, these include understanding that God made marriage to be between one man and one woman. Remember, Jesus said, have you not read? That he who created them in the beginning made them male and female. Why would he say that there? Why would he say he made them male and female? What was the reason for that? He's letting us know that, that God made marriage to be exclusively between one man and one woman. Not one man and one man. Not one woman and one woman. Not one man and two women. Or one woman and two men. No, Jesus said God made marriage to be between one man and one woman. That's the way it was intended to be from the beginning. That's what Jesus says. And when it comes to this one man and this one woman who enter into this relationship, Jesus also says that they are to leave father and mother. Do you see that? And cleave or be joined. Some of your translations may say joined or cleave. Cleave or joined to their spouse. Now, what does that mean? Well, let me first tell you what it doesn't mean. It does not mean that married people are not to love and honor and respect and be there for their parents. It does not mean that. But it does mean they ought to separate from them. It does mean they ought to make their own decisions and have their own family and be committed primarily to one another. They are not to forsake responsibility to their parents. They are not to forsake honoring their parents, but they ought to forsake being under their rule and authority. That's what the Lord is saying. They ought to have their own household and their own family. Jesus says, you leave father and mother, you be joined, you cleave to your spouse. And then, Jesus says, you become one flesh. And at verse 5, you become one flesh. What does that mean? That's interesting. Wouldn't you agree? One flesh. While that does have some to do with a sexual relationship, there's no doubt about that. I do submit to you, it's more than just that, though. It's more than that. Being one also includes being one in agreement and purpose in life. It includes striving each and every day to, to understand each other's likes and dislikes. Striving every day to make each other happy. It includes sharing, being in fellowship. When it comes to some of the most important things that life has to offer. Sharing a home together. Sharing space together. Sharing life together, sharing money, sharing time, sharing essentially everything that life has to offer. It also includes sharing the closest relationship that two people can share in this life. Laughing together, crying together, taking care of each other in times of sickness, raising children together, going through times of happiness and even sadness together, taking the journey of life together. Ladies and gentlemen, that is what it means to be one. We're one. And wouldn't you agree that oneness, that one flesh relationship, that doesn't happen overnight, does it? That's a journey. That's a lifelong process. you got to be one. And you also got to have order in the house. You know what God's order for the household is? You wouldn't know this into the media today. But Jesus tells us, the gospel tells us, God's order is that the man, the husband, the father, be the head or the leader of the family. And, and his gospel is that the woman be the helpmate or the support to her husband. Genesis 2 verse 18, God looked at the man and said, it is not good for him to be alone. I will make him a helpmate, not a leader. I'll make him a helpmate that is suitable for him. The Apostle Paul will put it this way in Ephesians chapter 5. The Apostle Paul says, Wives, submit to your own husbands, ask the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife. As also Christ is the head of the church, and he is the Savior of the body. Therefore, just as the church is subject to Christ, so let the wives be to their husbands in everything. Now this right here is God's order for marriage. And I know I'm being videoed right now, and I know I've just circulated on one of the news networks. A lot of people be mad at me. I understand that what I'm saying right now is not politically correct. I understand that these things that we're looking at right now that make a lot of people mad. They don't like these things. They think they're old and outdated. And they may feel that way, but we need to understand that this is still God's plan. This is still the will of God. This is still the way God set it up 
all the way back in the beginning. This is how God set it up. And my brothers and sisters, we got to be sold on this. We got to be bought in on this. We got to understand that a lot of this stuff we see going on in the world today, this is not part of God's plan. This is not part of the will of God. For example, cohabitation. Cohabitation, a.k.a. shacking, as some of the older folks used to call it. A.k.a. living together without being married and you engage in sexual immorality. That is not part of God's plan. That is not part of God's order. Never has been and never will be. And no matter what the Supreme Court says, same-sex marriage, that's not part of God's order. That's not right, and it's never going to be right. That's not what God wants. That's not what God intended when he made marriage in the beginning. And and divorce without scriptural cause, that's not part of God's order. That's not part of God's plan. I'm going back to Matthew 19. Look at verse number 9. In Matthew 19 and verse 9, Jesus says, And I say to you, whoever divorces his wife, except only for this reason, except for sexual immorality in marriage of the woman, commits Adultery. Notice how Jesus says that the only time God will grant a scriptural divorce is when you have an innocent person putting a guilty person away for sexual immorality. That is what Jesus said. That's the will of God. And so divorce for not without scriptural cause, breaking apart what God has put together without scriptural cause, that's not part of God's order. And then marrying somebody who has been put away for sexual immorality, marrying somebody who does not have a right to get married because they're bound to somebody else, that's also not part of God's order. In Luke 16, verse 18, Jesus says, Everyone who divorces his wife and marries another commits adultery, and he who marries one who is divorced from a husband commits adultery. Now, I understand that a lot of people may not like these things. I understand that some people may look at these things and they may say, well, what about this situation? What about that situation? What about that situation? I understand we do a good job coming up with all these different hypothetical situations, but let me tell you something. No matter how many hypothetical situations that we come up with, Jesus still said what he has said, and it's pretty clear and it's easy to understand. And no hypothetical situation we come up with this morning is going to change what Jesus has said. And so the wise thing for us to do would just to, to, to abide by his teachings and just do what he says. Jesus says God has order. God has laws that he's put in place when it comes to marriage. And but let's go back to the beginning and consider how Jesus also teaches us about how from the beginning we learn something about permanency. Permanency. What do I mean by that? Well, by that I mean God wants us to understand that marriage is to be a lifelong commitment. A lifelong commitment. And what a rare concept in our time today. Wouldn't y'all agree? And what a rare concept. But it is definitely what the Word of God says. And so we go back to Matthew 19 and we look at verse number 6. We go to Matthew 19 and we look at verse 6 where Jesus says, and look at this carefully. Jesus says, So there are no longer two but one flesh, What therefore God has joined together, let no man separate it. Now go to Romans chapter 7, because Paul will echo this. In Romans the 7th chapter, in verse number 2. In Romans the 7th chapter, in verse number 2, Paul says, For the married woman is bound by law to her husband while he's what? While he is living. But if her husband dies, she's released from the law concerning her husband. Look at 1 Corinthians chapter 7. 1 Corinthians chapter 7 and verse number 39. Just want you to know is the first part here. 1 Corinthians 7 verse 39. A wife is bound as long as her husband lives. But if her husband dies, she is free to marry whom she wishes only in the Lord. Notice how Paul, what Paul says, what Jesus says. When you think about these words, isn't that exactly what we promised the day we got married? I mean, isn't that it? Think back to your wedding day. On your wedding day, didn't you not look at the person you're, the person you, you love, the person you probably sitting next to this morning? And you said, I'll be with you for better or worse. Sickness through sickness and in health, for rich or poor, what was the last part? To death do us part. 
That's what we said, didn't we? We said that. And I want you to understand that those are more than just nice, fancy words to say. Brothers and sisters, those were promises. Those were biblical promises. Those were promises we made to God and we made to the person that we were marrying. Those were promises that line up exactly with what we just read in the Word of God. Go back to Matthew 19 and verse 6. Look at Matthew 19, 6 very carefully. Notice the part where Jesus says, What therefore God has joined together, let no man separate. Do you see that? That language, where therefore God is joined together, that, that language is so important to understand. That language em- em- emphasizes emphatically that the marriage relationship is to be a lifelong relationship. It is to be a, a permanent relationship. In fact, that language, joined together, that Jesus uses there, literally means that when one man and one woman get married, God glues them together. They are bound together by the law of God. Only death can separate them. That's what Jesus is saying. That's what he's saying. It's not to last a mere 55 hours or 72 hours, like in the case of Kim Kardashian and Britney Spears. It's not to be a relationship where the man gets tired of his wife's cooking or he doesn't like her appearance anymore or the woman just doesn't feel like her husband's making her making her happy any, anymore. She wants to move on. She wants to be with somebody else. No, sir, no, ma'am. Jesus says that from the beginning, God made marriage to be a lifelong commitment. From the beginning, God made marriage to be something to where only death can separate the people. That's going back to the beginning. It says that when you study the first marriage, you're going to learn a lesson about permanency. But I want to move on. I want to show you now how when you go back to the first marriage, the world's first marriage, you also learn a lesson about intimacy, sexual intimacy. When you go back to the beginning with me again, look at Genesis, Genesis chapter 2. Or Genesis chapter 1, I'm sorry. Genesis 1 and verse 28. Genesis 1, 28. After making man and fe- male and female in his image, it says, God created, blessed them, and he said to them, Be fruitful, multiply, fill the earth, and subdue it and rule over the fish of the sea, and over the birds of the sky, and over every living thing that moves on the earth. Go to chapter 2 now. Look at verse 24. In Genesis 2 and verse 24, For this reason a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife, and they shall become one flesh. Verse 25, And the man and his wife were both naked, and they were not ashamed. But I want to say here, it's simple and it's straight to the point. All I want to say to you in this point is this right here. I want to say that when we study the world's first marriage, we learn that in the eyes of God, sexual intimacy is good, it is honorable, and it is proper when it is kept in the marriage bed. When it is reserved to be exclusively performed between a husband and his wife. That's what we learn all the way back in the beginning. And for those of you who may be a little, little uncomfortable with this right now, let me just say we got to get over that. We got to get over that. We got to understand that God is the one who invented sex and sexual intimacy. We didn't invent that. We didn't come up with that. God did. God is the one who created that. And God has reserved that for marriage. God has reserved that to be between a husband and his wife. We see that when we study Adam and Eve. Look at the text again. When you go back to Genesis 1 and verse 28, the Bible says that after God made Adam and Eve and after God married them, he told them to be fruitful and multiply. Last time I checked, that requires sexual intimacy, right? That's sexual intimacy. In chapter 2, he says he wants, he wants them to be one. Again, part of that does have to do with the sexual relationship. And then in verse number 25 of that chapter, the Bible says that Adam and Eve were naked around each other, and they were not ashamed. That's something else that God wants for marriage. Today, even in our marriages, like Adam and Eve, God wants a husband and a wife to be able to be naked and not ashamed around each other behind closed doors. God wants a husband and a wife to be able to undress and take their clothes off around each other, and to not be ashamed, and to not be ashamed when they're being intimate with one another. That's what God wants to marriage. That's the way God made marriage all the way back in the beginning. He wants that for all marriages. But you know what God doesn't want? Do you know what is a sin? 
Do you know what is the complete perversion of what God has to say when it comes to this? Pornography. Looking at pornography. Looking at somebody who's not your spouse with lust in your heart, committing adultery in your heart. Committing fornication, having sex with your boyfriend or with your girlfriend, fooling around with them. Being promiscuous, having an affair, cheating on your spouse, sending sending new pictures of yourself on your cell phone to other people for them to look at. That is wrong. That is a sin. Those are things that may be acceptable in our society today, but they're not the will of God. They don't please God. They are not what God intended when he made sex and sexual intimacy. In Hebrews 13 and verse 4, the writer says, Marriage is to be held in honor among all, and the marriage bed is to be undefiled, for fornicators and adulterers God will judge. 1 Corinthians 6 and verse number 9, both fornication and adultery are listed there as being sins that if people commit them and don't repent of those things, they will not inherit the kingdom of God. Regardless of what our culture says about this issue, God's stance on it is pretty clear. It's very clear. It's always going to be the same. Again, God says that sex and sexual intimacy is good, it's honorable, and it's proper when it's kept in its proper place, when it's kept in the marriage bed. I want to to emphasize that to you this morning. Now, something else we learned, we studied the world's very first marriage. But i got one more thing I want to show you, and we'll be done. A final lesson I want to show you from the world's first marriage. Is fifth and finally, when we study this marriage, we also learn a lesson about purpose. That is, there's a valuable lesson here about the purpose of marriage. And so let me ask you, what's the purpose of marriage? Why did God even make marriage? Someone says, well, the main purpose for marriage, the main reason why God made marriage was to fulfill man's need for companionship. And I agree that that, that does Fulfill our need for companionship, doesn't it? Genesis 2, verse 8, God looked at Adam and said, It's not good for man to be alone. I will make him a helper that is suitable for him. Marriage does satisfy our need for companionship, but I submit to you that it's not the main reason God made marriage. Somebody else says, Well, the main reason has to do with the fact that marriage can benefit you because it can help keep you out of sin. They can help give you somebody who will who will help you go to heaven. Somebody who will help you be right with God. Well, again, I agree that marriage does help us in those ways. I agree that marriage is something that can help keep you out of sin, specifically sexual sin. And I agree that marriage is, is something that if you marry a faithful Christian, you will have somebody in your life who hopefully will make you better for God, who will help you go to heaven. No doubt all that's true. But again, that's not the main purpose of marriage. Listen carefully. Like everything else God created in the beginning. Think about all God made in the beginning. But like everything else God made in the beginning, God also made marriage to reveal His glory. To to reveal how awesome He is. To reveal how He is fully capable of providing for our every need, even our need for companionship. You see, like when God created the sun and the moon, the stars and the animals and the plants, and even us as human beings, when God created marriage, His glory was also revealed. His love was revealed. His power was revealed. His care, His omnipotence, all those things were revealed when God created marriage. Marriage reveals the glory of God, but the question is, are we glorifying God in our marriages? In 1 Corinthians 10, in verse number 31, the Apostle Paul says, Whatever then you eat or drink, or whatever you do, do all to the glory of God. Do all to the glory of God. Ladies and gentlemen, what Paul says there certainly applies to our marriages. You see, in the beginning, God made marriage to be a benefit. And to be a blessing to mankind. He made marriage as another avenue to to display his awesome love and his awesome glory to all mankind. But we got to make sure we glorify him in our marriages. And someone says, well, how do we do that? How do we glorify God in our marriages? Well, let me tell you how we do that. We do that by treating our spouse right. By loving them. By caring for them. By respecting them. 
we do that by always being honest with them and doing our best to never betray their trust. We do that by never treating them like garbage, treating them like trash. We don't treat our spouse like trash. We don't curse our spouse. We don't call our spouse ugly, derogatory names. When we do that kind of stuff, we don't show God any glory. We don't show any real love to the person we're supposed to be one with. The person we're supposed to be willing to die for. It doesn't bring God glory. Instead of doing those things, you know what we do? We put our spouse on a pedestal. We deal with them in an understanding way. We cherish them. We honor them. We, we be loyal to them. We be devoted to them. We treat them like fellow heirs to the grace of God. We treat them like we want to be treated. We love them with all our hearts. You see, through making marriage, God's glory is revealed. But we've got to glorify God in our marriage. Now, I've done my best this morning to try to show you some timeless truths that God's established about this relationship. I try to show you this by going back to the beginning. But the question is, are we sold on these things? Are we all in for these things? You know, our theme this year is what? What's our theme this year as a congregation? All in for Jesus. That's our theme. We're trying to be all in for Jesus. But let me tell you something. You can't be all in for Jesus if you're not all in for what he says about marriage. You can't do it. And so if you're going to be all in for Jesus, if I'm going to be all in for Jesus, we got to be all in for what he says about marriage. And the way we show that we're all in for marriage is very simple. We reflect that kind of attitude by making sure we do right in our marriages every day. It's just that simple. And for those of you who are not married this morning, I want you to understand something. I want you to understand you do not have to get married to go to heaven. I want you to understand that. I want you to understand that while marriage was made by God to benefit man, you do not have to get, be married to be right with God to become a Christian. What you do have to do, though, is obey the gospel. What you do have to do is become a Christian. What you do have to do is make sure you're part of the body of Christ, which is his spiritual bride, the church. And so have you done that? Are you part of the spiritual bride of Christ? I want to close by saying that we can be right in our marriages and, and wrong with God. Did you know that? We can be right in our marriages, be in scriptural marriages, be wrong with God, outside of Christ. And that describes you this morning is trying to change it. It's trying to be, it's trying to be right with God and right in your marriage. You need to obey the gospel, to believe in Jesus, repent of your sins, be immersed into the body of Christ, be immersed into the bride of Christ, which is the church. And if we can help you with that in any way, come to the front right now as we stand and as we sing. Sorrow, I will. 
Jesus is calling. He is calling.